If you like our content, please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get alerts when we introduce new videos. In this module, we're now going to cover the API between the Ruckus IoT controller and the user application. This particular presentation is going to cover an overview, a high level of the API, where it fits into the network, the system, and then some in brief introduction in how the API is structured, the processes used, and the application interfaces. So as we look at our network from an IoT perspective, we're, this module is really now going to focus on the Ruckus IoT controller and the API interface between the controller and third-party ma uh, third management applications. The same API can also be used for our integrated rules engine um, and also if required by a cloud application based on uh, party integration. The key thing to look at with the API is that the integration is based on the REST API uh, protocol. This is a representational state transfer or REST. This is uh, used specifically because it's a, a very well established standards based interface that is using existing and very well established protocols. Specifically, the REST API integrated within the IoT controller is based around an HTTP. So it's very much like people are used to developing for an application client uh, HTTP type interface. The uh, mechanism used to use the API between the host application and the application server, or in this case, the IoT controller, uses predefined mechanisms, for example, get, post, put, and delete. So with the combination of the HTTP get, post, put, delete, you're able to request information from the server, you're able to post information or push requests to the server, um, you're able to put and also to delete data uh, as all part of the standard API mechanism. The other reason or the other advantage of using the REST API is that it's very flexible with regards to how data is formatted where, when sending or receiving from the IoT controller. So the REST API supports protocols or formatting in a variety of different uh, structures. Within the IoT controller, though, we structure all of our payloads in the JSON format, which makes it very easy to index directly into payloads or messages looking for specific data types, values, or uh, fields. The REST API implementation is very simple to implement. It requires very little tools, very little understanding of uh, the higher IoT functionality, but it allows you to very quickly format the request for, uh, for data or to send a message to the controller. It's fully programmable and it's very configurable. And it also allows us within the IoT development team to add new features very quickly or new API functions within the REST API. From a drawback side, the one downside or two downsides really on the REST API format is that there are no states. The, the, it's really up to the user or the user's application to keep track of all of the states with regards to data, devices and messaging that's going on between the application and the server. The other issue really is that the, uh, for security reasons, the interface between the controller and the application is session based. So the application must request a session with the server or the IoT controller, and then we will issue a token to that application for a predefined amount of time. So again, the application needs to keep track of the schedules, the timers, and the timeouts for those tokens to ensure that the API re remains up and operational for full, for full duration. So as we look at the IoT controller and the REST API interface, the, the IoT controller is doing a lot of functionality as we covered in an earlier, mo earlier module uh, with interfacing to all of the IoT access points and the Zigbee and BLE and LoRa devices out there on the, on the edge. Though all of that information is brought back into the IoT controller through our MQTT interface and then it's stored and handled within our uh, Elastic Store and our, our database within the IoT controller. The IoT interface or the API is providing direct access into all of those modules. So we, through the API, we have access directly into the, uh, the storage or into the database. We have access to the MQTT interface. We also have access directly into the rules engine and into all of our agents that are running within the, within the IoT controller. The API itself can either be hosted on an external application server, 
a cloud service or you can run your application within the onboard rules engine and use all of the standard and same APIs. The other option you have available to you is also the integration of your application into the Ruckus IoT controller using our SDK environment, which has a separate API giving you more direct access into the lower layer uh, packets. So as we look at the, the REST API interface, the key thing really to understand is that this is the northbound interface. So this is for all traffic going up stream and to the application. Um, this is really uh, focused on the user or the host interface. Um, and as mentioned earlier, this is using the REST uh, API format and structure. It is a secure interface. It requires basic authorization. So you're, you will need to log in initially using the REST API basic author authorization and authentication mechanism. Once you do that using the API, you can then be issued with a token and you'll have an access token and a refresh token. All subsequent commands into the IoT controller must be encoded using the uh, access token. If they are not, then they, you will uh, automatically be thrown off, off of the system for security reasons. After the access token is expiring, then you can re, uh, request a new access token by using the refresh token key, uh, which means you don't need to go through the basic authorization again. Now, the key thing about the API is it gives you access to a lot of capabilities within the IoT controller. So from within the, uh, the API, the base function is now accessible that gives you all of the underlying services. So you can access device information. And by device, we mean the BLE, Zigbee, LoRa, or any of the devices that are out on the other side of the gateway. You can also access information with regards to the gateway. So if you wanted to, you can use the API to put the, the specific gateway into scan mode or to onboard devices through the API instead of using the onboard dashboard. There are a whole range of additional services around each of the different types of uh, endpoints. So Zigbee and Bluetooth, for example, would each have their own extensions within the uh, REST API to allow you to do more advanced functions or capabilities or to write, read and write directly to that sensor using the API. For example, you might want to turn a light bulb on or off, then you would be able to use the Zigbee extensions in the API to do that. And we will have a, an example of how you do that later in a different module. In addition to basic functions, you also have access through to the SDK. Now, the SDK is basically a mechanism that allows you to develop an application that runs inside the IoT controller, which are highlighted in pink on the, uh, the diagram. These are, for example, to allow you to communicate to a proprietary device or to a proprietary cloud service and run inside the controller and utilize your own API and still have access to basic functionality within the IoT controller using the SDK API. Within the services, we also have access to status information regarding the controller version, processing capabilities, services, and all the information about the IoT controller's general uh, operation and condition as well as insights into network analysis and an overall statistical information about what's going on within the controller and its devices. The API also allows you to manage things like software images and upgrades and patches of the IoT controller. Again, if you wanted to provide a overall manager of managers type capability, you could do that by developing an application that has all of these capabilities and then manages multiple IoT controllers through the API. Then we have things like additional just general general services. So within the IoT controller, obviously there are multiple services running that are running background tasks and um, overall management or communication between entities. Those can all be managed and monitored through the API as well. And then partner integration as well. So as we add more uh, partner solutions, you're able to manage the, the capability and extend, get information about how those partner services are working through the generic API. So one of the key things to look at when you're looking at the API is, is the documentation and support. So within the IoT controller, there is an IoT API tab, which allows you to have full documentation and information about the, uh, the API. So within the online reference manual or reference guide within the IoT controller, you have examples of each of the API uh, functions or the REST API capabilities, as well as examples for both command line and web HTTP type request function calls. So this is a, uh, an example of 
how to uh, request information from a device. You'll, you'll get information about examples of how you send and format that data, and then what the response codes or response message might look like for each of the types of messages you would send. There's also examples of common functions, for example, account listing and validation. So usernames and passwords, authentication, how do you request a token? How do you refresh the token? Those kind of level of um, functions that you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then more specific things like device capability. So how do I request information about a, a, a new device? How do I look for endpoints? How do I then read the capabilities of that device and have my application know that the device I've just added has these capabilities? Is it a door sensor, water sensor, motion sensor? We can gather all of that and bring that out to the API. Additionally, we can get information about all the logging and uh, events that are going on, both on the IoT controller, the virtual smart zone, and also the, uh, the gateway running on the edge. So we can see all of the information, the logs, in, and, and get information that you would normally see within the dashboard that is all extracted back out into the API for your application to expose and, and, and provide analytics on. And then on top of that, we have all the gateway capabilities from a management and operations. So we can change the, the gateway names, we can modify the, the settings for Zigbee, BLE, whatever. And then on top of that, we can also do some basic operations and management changes within the, uh, the gateway. So one of the key things then really is to look at how the API works with sensors. Because you know, when we look at IoT, really that it's all about those sensors on the edge. So really there are multiple ways that we can use the API to manage and interface to those devices that are on the edge. So the first thing we have is we have, we can query the database. So the, the IoT controllers onboard database keeps a real time live update of what the, the status is of every device in the, uh, in the network that is attached to the IoT controller. And that database is fully accessible through the IoT controllers API. So we can query that, uh, uh, that API using a standard query the controller using a standard API and get an update or specific information about a specific sensor or we can query the database and just give a list of all sensors you'll get less information you query them all but it'll give you enough to get, give an understanding of what's happening at a high level the second option we have is that we can bypass the controller and we can make a request directly onto the sensor so with the ZCL capabilities attribute we can actually now query the controller, which will then send a message directly to the gateway, which will then request from the sensor its current status. Now, this is giving you a more up-to-date condition status, but the downside is that it does require more network traffic because you have to request, you have to make three requests instead of one. But additionally, you're now also making a request on the radio. So whereas, control, whereas the controller is keeping the database up to date, when you query the controller, the message goes to the controller and you get the response back. When you query the device, it's going down four steps. And the final one is, is a Zigbee radio, for example. So this has uh, an RF implication. So you're going to be making more requests on the radio. But additionally, it will have a battery life implication on the uh, sensor because you are sending a message to the sensor. You're waking that device up. You're asking it for its current state it will then transmit that back so you can have a very large impact on your overall battery life and network utilization by querying the device versus the the, the sent, uh, versus the controller now there may still be conditions or, or certain types of sensors where you want to do that devices that are maybe mains or or uh, dc powered from an external power supply that's the battery life issue doesn't generally become a problem but you might also want to, um, they may also be running clusters that don't automatically update. So you may need to kick the sensor occasionally to get a, an update on what its current condition is. The third type of method of finding out an endpoint state is we have a, a capability called controller push or MQTT push, which we, we covered in a, an earlier module. This is a mechanism where instead of utilizing the API to query or poll the IoT controller or the device for its current status, we can actually have the device push a state change to us or to the controller and then directly to our application. So here, when a, a door or a sensor triggers or it has an update, that message is pushed to the gateway from the gateway to the controller and the controller will then forward that using a predefined API uh, socket into your application. So your application will always be up to date with, with the latest information. 
Now, the last event really means that you need to have a, an interrupt service routine of some mechanism to deal with a pushed event when it comes in. You need to be able to store that for, for, future, for, for future use, but also you need to be able to, to have some kind of mechanism to allow you to, to, to react if that packet comes in and it's, it's something that you're looking for versus a polling where you're already in a routine that's going to expect a certain response. So that, as I said, there are the direct method does have some system level implications. For example, battery life and the increased total network traffic. The the radio traffic and airtime utilization will also have a, an impact, and it will have to be something you consider as part of the deployment. You know, for a small deployment of 50 or 60 sensors, that is a, that's probably not a major issue. But as you get to five or 10,000 sensors within a building and you're starting to poll or you're finding doing a lot of radio requests of devices, you can you can have a, a serious amount of um, con, um, congestion within your Zigbee network, which means that if you are also looking for state changes, those devices may not be able to push updates to you because the network's congested. So this really is, is how you need to manage the scalability of your sensor network and how many devices you have on the, on the network. As I said, the event-based push is a much cleaner and a much uh, nicer way of dealing with uh, instantaneous updates. It also reduces the API complexity and it reduces the overall latency of updates from devices to applications. And today we're using a, an implementation of MQTT for that. And as I said, we cover that in an earlier module. So one of the key things is what can you do with the API and how is the API going to help me to actually design and build uh, applications? So the key thing really is that the API is there for third parties to build their applications and uh, to build up their their end use cases. So you know we, we have multiple interfaces available for, to give the the, you know, the maximum number of flexible uh, interfaces and to provide a lot of different ways for data to be pre presented or removed. So we have all of the controller functions which today are provided through the REST API which we're going to go into in detail. Then we also have a whole lot of network management and monitoring capabilities also through that REST API. And then we actually have the data, the payload, the information that tells us what's going on with our devices and our sensors. So we have a number of ways that we can get access to that. So we can do, for example, with LoRa, we use a WebSocket. So a, a very simple WebSocket interface will be pushed the information directly. Zigbee devices, obviously we have the REST API today, but we also have uh, the MQTT push. So that again is an option available to you. The same with BLE, so we can do both HTTP push, we can do MQTT push, we'll be able to do the REST API, as, as well as um, you know, wired devices which can use both MQTT and the REST API. So there are a whole range of different APIs and interfaces to connect to bring the data out. The most common ones you're going to come across realistically are going to be the REST API interface and the MQTT push, and if you're using LoRa it will be the, the WebSockets interface. And then whichever ones are being used are flexible. You can have multiple sessions open concurrently from multiple applications. So today, the, the Ruckus Rules Engine, which is running inside the controller, we're using the REST API and we'll be adding in the MQTT very, very soon. The controller, the user interface dashboard, if you like, is, is solely based on the REST API interface. Within our engineering team, Solutions Engineering, we use all of them. So we're using the REST API, HTTP push, you know, we're using uh, WebSockets, we're using uh, the SDK, and we're also using QTT uh, interface as well. And then when we look at the BLE SDK functions, which we're, we're introducing in our, as our, our SDK extensions, really you now get really much more lower layer interface. So you have access to, the, uh, to all the functions within the IoT controller, all the way out to the edge on the gateway to communicate and connect to BLE devices. They're not just beacons now, but maybe they have other advanced functions. So we're working on things like light bulbs, but also heart rate monitors, blood pressure monitors, door locks that have proprietary BLE um, capabilities mapping. You're able to develop your own application, run it on the IoT controller and connect to a proprietary device out on the edge. And the key thing, again, is partners who are integrating and using the platform use all of these technologies. They use all of these interfaces and all of these capabilities to design and build their application. So that's it for our introduction to the Ruckus API on the IoT controller. And next, we're going to go and look at more detail at each of the different elements. Mm -hmm.